deal. Okay. All right. So here's where we left off yesterday with the electrostatic force. And to a certain extent, we talked about that being almost like magic because of the fact that, you know, I can make something move without direct contact. You can make, apply that same idea to gravity. So if I drop this ball and let go of it, well, there isn't a resorbable force, but yet it accelerates. And so for a while, they equated this idea of gravity with kind of witchcraft. It was like, ooh, it makes it move, but there's nothing really directly in contact with it. So at the end of the 1800s, here's where we were in, in science. We had the atomic theory, John Dalton's atomic theory, life was cool, right? Thought everything was made of these particles. Hey, no worries there. We had the gravity, Newton's laws, had the calculus, all this good stuff. We could predict the motion of the planets with a high degree of precision, where Jupiter was going to be, when eclipses were going to happen. Oh, cool. Right? We thought we were all that in a bag of chips. And at the end of the wow. 1800s, they, everybody thought science was done. We had, they had thought we had nothing left to discover. We're finished. Here we go. So, but then they figured out that there was J.J. Thompson discovered these electrons. Okay, if you don't remember from Kim one, which hopefully you might remember more than the first block class, because first block class absolutely doesn't remember Jack from Kim one. Oh, seriously, it's like, do y'all remember this? No. It's like, I know you covered it. No, we don't remember. Okay. So, anybody remember what J.J. Thompson discovered? No. Kind of light. Yeah. Light? Okay. 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 Thompson used a cathode ray tube. Oh, yes. Okay. And there was these particles streaming through. Nobody knew what they were. But he figured out that they were negatively charged because what he did is he put like, like on your battery, it has a positive and negative side to it. So he, he had a positive and negatively charged plate on either side that creates an electric field. And these particles would be attracted towards the positive and repulsed towards the negative. He said, oh, okay, at least I, these are negatively charged particles. Okay? We call them chihuahuas in our example, but he called them negatively charged particles and called them electrons. So if there's electrons, why could, the, why could we not be here having this discussion if the only thing that existed in the universe was electrons? We'd all be repulsing from each other. Yeah, you, you would never form bonds, okay? Nothing, no, no, nothing would ever form, okay? Everything would just be continuously flying away from each other. So now, why the universe chose to produce negatively charged electrons and positively charged protons, we don't know. We're happy that it did, or otherwise we wouldn't be here. We don't even know why it has gravity. Again, we're happy that it does, but we don't know why. So, you know, this particle is going through. They're positive or negatively charged. They're flying up there. So, I figure, okay, there has to be positively charged particles. So, then, the first model of the atom they came up with was the plum pudding model. Anybody remember the plum pudding model? Yeah, no. No. Sort of. Sort of, okay? Here's what has to happen about any atomic model. It has to explain the stability of the atom, because atoms are stable. I've had this table since the fall of 1994, okay? When I walk in this room, there's a lot of things I worry about. That table being a squirrel isn't one of them, okay? This is going to be a table. The atoms, when you wake up in the morning, the makeup of your fingers are probably the same atoms that you went to bed with the night before. Okay, you're not going to wake up and go, oh my God, you know, my hand is now a squirrel. No, okay? They're stable. They are incredibly stable for an extremely long period of time. So the beauty of the plum pudding model is that, okay, hey, this is like this balancing act. Got some positive, got some negative charge. They're evenly distributed. That allows this to happen. But here's what the chemistry people don't like to admit, is if you look at all of the big hitters in the atomic theory, J.J. Thompson, Ernest Rutherford, Max Planck, Niels Bohr, Erwin Schrodinger, they were all physicists, okay? Even though the chemistry department talks about like the history of the atom, they were all physicists. Because the running joke was that everybody in the chemistry department was figured out how to the best way to like, you know, make drugs. And so they said, the physicists basically said, you guys can go figure out how to make drugs, we'll figure out the structure of the universe. And they said, okay, it was cool. Now, you got to remember how physicists approach the world. So J. J. Thompson found the electron, and then they said, "Okay, well, is this plum pudding model valid?" So then along comes 
Ernest Rutherford. Anybody remember what Ernest Rutherford did? He did the gold foil. Oh, he did the gold foil. Oh, the gold foil guy. Right. Okay. It's the most misunderstood, screwed up explanation that most of you got in the entire world. So here's what happened. The beauty of gold foil is that you can basically work it down to where it's like a single layer fit. It appears solid to us, like you can't see through it, but it appears solid. So he took this sheet of gold foil, and then he had a box that had radioactive thorium in it. The radioactive thorium would emit particles called, that he didn't know what they were. He called them alpha particles because he didn't know what they were. So, okay, we'll call them alpha particles. So it turns out that the alpha particle was the helium nucleus. Now, let's test your Chem 1 knowledge. So what's the two represent? The number of protons. Atomic. Atomic number, which is the number of protons. protons. What does four represent? Mass. Mass number, which is the total number of protons, protons. protons and neutrons. Okay, nice. That's the first block you had. You were like, I don't know. Okay. And the two plus indicates that it has? Uh -huh. So it basically lost its two electrons. So basically it's just a helium nucleus. So in everybody's mind, you all think that, oh, you can see these particles as they were going towards the gold foil, okay, like little marbles. This was a single helium nucleus, okay? You can't see it. There's no way you can see it. So what he did is he put a phosphorescent screen behind it. The cool thing about phosphorescence is that when these particles would hit them, it would emit a small flash of light. So if you're in a darkened room, what you'd see when these particles would strike it, you'd see a flash of light. So he kind of replicated what Thompson did. He put a positively charged plate on one side and a negatively charged plate on the other. And these particles, in contrast with the electrons, these particles would be deflected down towards the negative and away from the positive. Because, oh, okay, right. These, these are positively charged particles. So here's the significance of this. And here's the great analogy of how physicists approach the world. And, and this, is, this is the same thing that happens here. So the classic story with physicists is, you, okay, you give a physicist a Volkswagen bug. And you say, hey, Mr. Physicist, what's the Volkswagen bug made of? I don't know. Let's ram it into a wall. Okay. So we get the Volkswagen bug up to about 30 miles an hour, and we slam it into a wall. Okay. What flies off? Oh, there's a bumper. Oh, okay. So there's a bumper. Well, that's cool. So then you go, 30 miles per hour is good, 300 miles per hour must be better. So now we get this thing up to 300 miles per hour, slam it into the wall, and go, oh, look, there's like a fender and glass. Okay, that must be part of the Volkswagen butt. 300 is good, 3,000 is going to be better. So now we get it up to 3,000. Wow, there's an engine inside of this thing. How cool. What's the engine made of? I don't know. Let's get the engine up to like 30,000 miles an hour, and we'll slam it. Wow, there's a piston inside. Cool. What's the piston made of? I don't know, but let's find a way to get two pistons going in opposite directions, at like close to the speed of light, and we'll slam them together, and we'll see what flies off, and then we'll figure out what the pistons are made of. That's literally how physicists approach the world, okay? If we, we we're going to throw stuff at it and see what bounces off. And so that's how, like, if you've ever heard of CERN, which is a large hadron collider, which sits on the border of Switzerland and France, okay? This is what particle accelerators do. We slam stuff together, and we see what goes flying off, and boom, okay, here we go. So, that's what Rutherford did. He took these particles, he didn't know what they were, but he knew they were positively charged. And he shot them at the gold foil and go, oh, what goes flying off? But what they found is that even though this appears solid, the flashes of light, for the most part, were directly behind the screen, like there was no deflection at all. So this is before the days of computer. This was done in like the early 1920s. So if you were one of Rutherford's graduate assistants, you would sit in a darkened room with, with a radioactive source emitting particles that you don't know what they are. And you would sit there with a piece of paper and you would make marks on the piece of paper where you saw the flashes of light. <laughs> no, no, that, that was your job. And they were going, well, that job would suck. But you were working with Ernest Rutherford, who was this bigger than life guy who was from New Zealand, had this great handlebar mustache, and it was just, you ever go back in time, go, met, go back and hang out with Ernest Rutherford. He's a good guy. So, but they were sitting in this darkened room, and they're going, hey, this is cool. We're trying to figure the structure of the universe. So 
Sometimes they would get deflected maybe like 5 degrees. Others might get deflected like 15 degrees. Not very many. So you saw, fur you saw a smaller and smaller and smaller number of deflections. But every once in a while, like every once in every million, what you would see is that that particle would bounce back and you would see the flash behind the radioactive source. So then, now here's what's important. They realize, wow, this thing is bouncing back. But the particles you're sending is positively charged. So what's the only way that you can bounce back a positively charged particle? Is if it encounters a positively. another positive charge. Okay? Now, since this is such a small number that bounces back, even though it appears solid, you've got to figure that this gold is mostly empty space. So it would be like me sitting here and taking this golf ball and throwing it at the wall. Now, even, the wall, even though the wall would appear solid, I would throw that thing a million times, 999,999 times, that, wall, that ball goes through, that, through the wall and we never see it again. But one time out of a million, it's going to come bouncing back. So what are you, conclude, what are you going to conclude about that wall? It's mostly what? Empty, Empty space. Right? Now, this creates a huge problem, because now everybody's going, God, we screwed this deal up again, now what do we do? So Rutherford comes along and says, look, boys and girls, here's your atom, which on a scale would be something like this, and that nucleus is this tiny, tiny, which, this is more than what it actually is. So it's this tiny, tiny dot in the middle. This is where 99.9% .9 of the mass is located. And everybody's going, oh, well, this just is weird. Because here's the deal. What's wrong with having all of that positive charge in the nucleus? What do those positive charges want to do? Repel. They want to go away. Like when I tried to put the two balloons together yesterday, it had nothing to do with each other. So now they're going, well, crap. Now we've got to start all over. Because now, how do we explain all of these positive charges located in one small area? Now, I can say this because I grew up with three older sisters, okay? So, let's say that you have six girls that hate each other, okay? And have since, like, seventh grade. Because somebody said something about somebody on Instagram, Snapchat, whatever social media that you use to stalk each other. I don't care. Pick one. And that's what you all use it for, let's be honest. And so... Or they wore the same dress or the same dance or something. Anyway, they've never forgiven each other because you girls hold a grudge and don't act like you don't. I had three older sisters. I know this. So, like, it's to the point, like, if they, like they, if they see one of them walking down the hall, they will go down the other hall just to avoid running into them, okay? However, you take those same six girls that hate each other, but if you put them into a confined space like a Volkswagen bug, okay, and this is before you run it into the wall, by the way. But you put them all into a very, very confined space. Oh, my God, they are best friends. They're taking selfies. They're doing all this. Oh, my God, love you. Let me braid your hair. Okay, whatever. Okay? Whatever y'all do. So, but that's only true if you put them in this confined space. If you get them out of the confined space, guess what? They hate each other again, and they're repulsed. So... Something has to happen inside the Volkswagen bug that's stronger than the natural repulsion of the girls. But it only happens inside the Volkswagen bug. So the same thing is true of protons. Protons don't like each other. They want to go flying apart. So they had to come up with like a new force, and this is called the strong nuclear force. So the strong nuclear force acts over an extremely short distance, like 10 to the negative 13 meters. But it's the strongest of all of the forces. Now, I promise you, I'm going to ask you this question on the multiple choice portion of the forces test. It's going to be multiple choice. There's four fundamental forces. Gravity, electromagnetic, strong nuclear, weak nuclear. I will tell you right now, don't choose weak nuclear. It will not be one of the correct answers, okay? Because weak nuclear is important, but it only plays out by fission and fusion processes, which we won't talk about, okay? It's important for the sun to operate and produce uh, helium, and energy, but it's not what it's not what we're about. So I'm going to ask, what is the strongest force? Do not overcomplicate this. The strongest force is strong, strong nuclear, nuclear force. 
don't miss the question. Don't overthink it. Okay? I'm going to ask you that question on the test. And mark my words, some of you are going to miss this question. Even though you all giggle right now and go, Mrs. Burkett, we won't miss that question. You mark my words, somebody's going to miss this question. Okay? Don't overthink it. Now, gravity is actually the weakest of all the forces. And then the electromagnetic forces is kind of there in between. So, when you talk about the gravitational force, and work, if you not write this down, I'm going to spend a lot of time talking about this equation. But to calculate the gravitational force between any two objects, it's big G. This is just a number. Don't flip out. We'll get to the number later. And then it's mass 1, mass 2, and distance squared. So what this means is that right now, you all are gravitationally attracted to this big rock that we're on. So if I take the mass of Vonda, the mass of the Earth, and the fact that Vonda is about 6.637 times 10 to the 6 meters away from the center of the Earth, and multiply it by this random number, I can figure out the gravitational attraction between Vonda and the Earth. Okay? So what this means is that we're all interconnected. You all are gravitationally attracted to each other within this room. Okay? Because you all have mass and you all have distance. Now, Hunter's way over here, right? Mary's over there. Right now, that's a pretty big gap between the two of them. So there's not much of a gravitational attraction. Now, Mary, though, is sitting right beside Vonda. Vonda and Mary, that attractive force is going to be much stronger because of the fact that they're closer. Now, but Mary is conflicted because she's torn, because she has Evelyn on one side and she has Vonda on the other. So Mary is like pulled in both directions. Okay? But she's gravitationally attracted to everything. So the only way that you can be in like zero gravity is the ultimate freshman mentality, is if you are the only thing in the universe. Okay? If there is anything else in the universe, you are gravitationally attracted to it. So you're attracted to the Earth, the Moon, the Sun, everything, every bit of matter in the universe you are gravitationally attracted to because you have mass and so does the other thing and there's a distance between them. Now, it's pretty weak, so it isn't like I'm going to be here and as I get closer and closer to the golf ball, eventually the golf ball is going to start rolling towards me, which would be weird. Okay? That's not going to happen. But as, as I do get closer, that force does become a little bit stronger because you're dividing by d squared. Now, the electrostatic force, and again, do not write down this equation. I would never ask you anything specific about this equation. I just want to point this out. So your electrostatic force is F equals K. Again, it's a number. It's called Faraday's constant. Don't worry about it. So you have F equals K, Q1, Q2 over distance squared. These are the amount of charge on the particles. So yesterday I had like the two balloons. So this would be the charge on one balloon, this would be the charge on the other balloon, and this would be how far apart they are. Now, as I brought the balloons closer, what happened to the force between the balloons? It became greater because you're dividing by a smaller number. So at this point, people were going, wow, we kind of got this deal figured out. If you notice, these are similar values, similar type structures of equations. They both involve a constant, it's just a number. Mass is a fundamental unit of, un of the universe, it's mass. This is charge, like every proton electron that we've ever studied has the same amount of charge, 1.60 times 10 to the negative 19th coulombs. Again, I'm not going to expect you to know that number, but that's what it is. So every electron and proton that we've ever studied always has the same amount of charge. So this will allow you to calculate either an electrostatic repulsion, so if you have like two things that are the same charge, but this is going to tell you how much force there is that's going to repel them, or the attractive force if they're oppositely charged. Gravity is always attractive. We don't have to worry about that. You know, it's always going to be attractive. So <coughs> these are these two big equations. Everybody was cool. Then Rutherford came along, hey, how do you explain the nucleus? Well, we've got to introduce a new force, which is that strong nuclear force. Then they had some other stuff going on once we started to study nuclear fusion and fission reactions that we couldn't explain with the other three. They said, okay, well, right, here we go. Now we have to have the weak nuclear force. So on the multiple choice section, do not pick the weak nuclear force. It's not going to be one of the answers. I'm going to list it, but don't pick it, okay? So if I say, hey, what keeps the Earth in orbit around the sun? What are you going to pick? The strong nuclear force. Dear Lord, if you pick that, I'm going oh, to... Oh, wait. Sorry. <laughs> 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 
exactly what we do. We got those tests back Friday and grading them. You're just like, you throw them down, you put them back, and you get them all out again. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Like three or four times. Oh, I know. So how about gravity, right? <laughs> now, let's talk about the electromagnetic force. The electromagnetic force is, is the most diverse of all the forces. It's what allows us to have light. It's what allows us to have blue colored shirts as opposed to black colored shirts as opposed to white colored shirts. Because electromagnetic force dictates how light is produced and how it interacts. So one of the greatest things that we've ever done as a civilization is to have the ability to manipulate the electromagnetic force. Here's the classic example. Let's say, for example, you, you have one of like a, the uh, Eversharp pencils, okay, that has graphite in it, okay? So you got this little piece of graphite that you put in it, refill it. So what we've done is we figured out a way to take graphite, which is basically carbon, and hold it together to make that thin little piece of graphite that you can put in your pencil. So there's enough of a bond that hold the carbon atoms together to make it into graphite. But then you write on your paper. Well, what happens when you write on the paper? Apart. It rubs off. Basically, you tear apart the bonds that hold the particles together as graphite. But it tears apart that bond, but then it forms a bond with the paper. Because it isn't like you write on the paper and then you lift up your paper and then all that graphite goes falling off, right? It's like, what's the point? So, now, why don't we write in, in diamonds? Because diamonds are carbon as well. Yeah, would, would the carbon in the diamond go rub off on the paper? No, it would be really weird if it is. Like, oh, want a new shaped diamond here or just rub it on the paper? Okay, there we go. Okay? No. It's, it's, you know, it's one of the hardest substances on earth. It's, so, it's diamonds, which is also made of carbon atoms. So, if you take carbon atoms in one arrangement, you can write with it. You take carbon atoms in another arrangement, and it's one of the hardest structures on the surface of the earth. So that's one of the things that we figured out. It's like, hey, okay, 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 what can we do with this? Now, let's say, God forbid, you make a mistake when you've written on that paper. What are you going to do? Erase it. Erase it. So what happens in the eraser process? You're breaking the bonds that hold the carbon to the paper. So even if you look at that simple act of writing, from an atomic perspective, it's pretty cool. So we can hold it together. Write with it, break the bonds, it sticks to the paper, you make a mistake, you rub that off, boom, now it's gone. Look at clothes. What's the purpose of laundry detergent? To tear it off. But what does that mean? To tear what off? Dirt. Stuff you don't to want. To break the bonds between the dirt and the clothes. And the clothes. That's the fundamental purpose of it. But you don't want this to be so strong that it breaks the bonds that hold the clothes itself together. Okay? It's like, uh oh, oh, add too, too strong a detergent. What happened to your clothes? I don't know, they're just gone. I just got some water, okay? They're dissolving. So, literally, so that's one of the cooler things that we pulled off as human beings is to be able to manipulate the forces that hold particles together, okay? That's what allows us to have like clear water, plastic, you know, but if you manipulate that same plastic, then it's orange, or it could be clear, or it could be blue. Okay, so we've done a bunch of cool things with this electromagnetic force. It allows us to make toast. Okay, now it does. It allows us to make toast. And so you know, when you look at this photovoltaic system, which hopefully I've got a big meeting today after school, and then another one tomorrow morning, and uh, and Nick had asked about it. Yet yeah, there's a chance I might be able to like have a a company basically write the check for the whole thing, they'll own it, it's a long story. But, so that would be cool because then by the, hopefully, best case scenario, even by like January 1st, we could have this whole solar system up and running. Uh, and to give you some perspective on like how big this system is, so I'll show you this map. Great. So, this map shows all the schools in the United States that have solar panels on them. And so, California, Colorado, okay, they've got a lot. East Coast voted with them. Notice that there's a big gap right here from the Canadian border, North Dakota, South Dakota, Nebraska, and even within the state of Kansas. And so, when you look at the state of Kansas, 
Yeah, total 0.4 schools that have gone slower. So, so you can click on it, like there's a 0.7 kilowatt system. Uh, there's like 10 kilowatts. So to give you some perspective, our system is going to be like 240 kilowatts. So basically, if you add up all the scholar output from all the schools from the Red River, which separates Oklahoma and Texas north all the way up to the Canadian border, that solar system that we're going to put in is bigger than like everything combined in that whole corridor from, from the southern border of Oklahoma all the way up to Canada. And so it's going to be a cool deal. <laughs> so, and so, invariably, people ask things like, you know, Brickham, why did you do this? Here's the reason why. It's because my dad had, had to quit school basically after like eighth grade. Was, he was, grew, grew up in the Depression, family farm that lived out by Andale, and he just had to quit and work on the family farm to make it work. And so dad never got the chance to graduate from high school or go to college. And, but he was the most brilliant mechanical mind of anyone that I, that I have ever known in this, in this world, no matter college professors, whatever, he was the most, was the most brilliant mechanical mind. But what he left it, in terms of the legacy with us kids was that he always stressed that, you know, your obligation is to leave this world a better place than how you found it. You know, you're, you're just passing through this world and you do something to leave it better. And since, you know, I've never had any kids, and so this is what I'm doing. So this is the legacy that I want to leave for your kids and, 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 your, and your kids and your grandkids and kids that I, I would never teach. Because I know enough science that we're going to screw this deal up, okay, in terms of carbon dioxide emissions and everything else. And so this is why I did this. I mean, I could retire in a couple of years and kick back and, you know, have the easy way out. But it's just not what my father would want. And so that's why I'm doing this, is because of the legacy that my, my dad left me. So that's why, if you look on, like my name will never show up on any of this. My dad's name will, because this is why I'm doing it, is because of the legacy that my father left for me. And so that's why this whole deal is going to happen, hopefully. So by Monday, I'll have, I'll, hopefully I've got some great news to report. We can say, hey, we did it, or, you know, best case scenario, like, we're cranking out a whole bunch of electricity by the first of the year, and it would be cool, and you all can say, yeah, we were there when that happened. So, yeah, that was my physics teacher. Cool. Okay. Anyway, that's the story. Yeah. All right. And so basically, how the photovoltaic system will work, it's a cool deal. You have photons being emitted from the sun. They're going to travel about eight and a half minutes, and they're going to get here, and they're going to strike the solar panels and be out here by the transportation area, and then... That's going to strike a silicon-based material. It's going to take an electron, a chihuahua. So a photon is going to hit a chihuahua. The chihuahua is going to get so much energy that it breaks free from it. And then we harness that whole bunch of chihuahuas and channel it and into the school. And then at the end of the day, I can make toast. So that's how, that's how every electricity story ends. At the end of the day, I can make toast. So that's going to be standard game. OK. So, it'll be a cool deal. Seriously, I mean, if you look at this map, there is nothing north of us. Yes? So, is it going to be, like, enough power that we'd even be able to have, like, leftover No, because they, they capped the system at 240 kilowatts. Oh, okay. So, in round numbers, like, if you took the solar output for the school, it's going to produce about enough electricity where we could be off the grid for about 40 days out of the year. So, to give, this, to give some perspective. Yeah, it's a lot. Yeah, it's, so then, it's a lot. So, like, relative to all the schools with solar systems in the nation, how large is it? As best I could tell, it's the biggest one that I found. Now, there are, there are districts that have, like, all the buildings have. But as far as, like, individual buildings, I haven't been able to find a, a building, one single building that has this big a system. How much electricity do we use, like, right now? Our, our monthly electrical bill at this school is about thirty to thirty-six thousand dollars a month. Damn. Yeah, that, that that's our electrical bill. So and then the Mays Career Academy is a separate deal as well. So that's what we got to decide whether we're going to tie into our system or tie into the Mays Career how Academy. But it's still going to be like all tied into the same system. So then, how much money will this save the district a month? In round numbers, if. It's, it's, it's complicated because based upon peak usage and how it's built, 
I conservatively think we're going to save about $36,000 a year for us, which would be about $3,000 a month. And is the plan to take that money and put new solar panels on different schools? Yeah, so the, the ultimate goal is then we're going to save that money and then we'll put them on May South and then we'll start at the middle schools. But the other schools are capped at 150 kilowatts because those the other schools are on West Arm. This school is on the Central County Cooperative. Central County Cooperative is more accepting of solar panels, so we can put a huge system here. The other schools, we can, their West Arm caps it at 150 kilowatts. So, but still, I mean, even if you add up in the state of Kansas, even one 150 kilowatt school is bigger than what exists now, the sum total in the state of Kansas. So, yeah, we'd certainly be the first district to have all schools with generating electricity that way. So, okay, back to physics. All right, so here I've got a block of wood, right? Now, what forces hold the particles that make up the wood together? Gravity, strong nuclear, or electromagnetic? Strong nuclear. No, that holds the nucleus together. What holds the, the individual atoms together? Electromagnetic. Electromagnetic force. That's what allows us, okay? It was pretty solid. In reality, it's 99% empty space. Don't flip out and go, no, it's not, it's solid. It appears solid, it's really not. He, here's the other thing is that I'm not actually touching the wood in the sense that it's like trying to put two balloons together. The, the, electri the, the chihuahuas that make up the wood and the chihuahuas that make up my hand don't like each other, so they don't actually touch because they're repulsed. And so, and it's kind of cool. And don't think about this too much or you'll do drugs. So let's say it's cold outside and you have lost your mittens, okay? What do you do with your hands? You rub them together, right? So here's the deal. The particles that make up this hand don't like the particles that make up this hand. So when you rub them together, basically you're making the chihuahuas not happy. And the chihuahuas aren't happy, they generate heat, which you feel, which is just a form of electromagnetic radiation, just like this light is. So the chihuahuas, when you rub them, they go, yip, 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 this sucks, okay? And they give off heat. So, but you're doing work because you're exerting a force over a distance. But when you clap your hands together, you never have to worry about like a pinky from your right hand merging with this hand and sticking together. It isn't like, whoa, wow, they stuck. No, they don't like each other. Even the atoms that make up this hand don't like each other. So if you do like one hand clapping like this, I don't have to. You can either do it or you can't. So. Okay, that's okay. That's just awkward. No, you can either do it or you can't. Don't try. Do it last. Stop. I can't do it. Yes. I told you. I could palm a basketball since I was in third grade. <laughs> 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 So <laughs> you don't move your right. Oh, yeah, try it. Try it out. No, I'm not. They're just trying it real quick. I won't go in there or anything. Carson, get him. Okay. Just try it out real quick. Because I've had the same size hand. Okay. Shh. Okay. So. The electromagnetic force holds these bits of matter together into this block of wood. So that's holding this together. Now, when I drop it, what happens? Gravity. 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 Gravity happens, right? So what I want to be able to do is calculate or determine the gravitational attraction between yonder block of wood and this strange rock that we're on. So one of the things that you can do, there's two ways. One is that you can do, do a mathematical calculation. So here I have a one kilogram mass. So the first lab that you all did to determine Fg is, and this is what we talked about yesterday. You can take the mass of McGriddle and multiply that by G. So I could take one kilogram, multiply that by G, and I'm going to get 9.8 newtons if it's a one kilogram mass. If it's a half a kilogram mass, 
I would take 0.5 times g and I would get 4.9, okay? So if you know the mass, this is the easiest way to calculate the gravitational force. And remember, gravitational force and weight in a physics class mean the same thing, which is going to be measured in what units? Newtons. Newtons, okay? You're going to be measured in newtons. Now, the other way that you can measure this is just to use a scale. So, in the course of this lab, in this class, you're going to measure a lot of forces, okay? Because it's kind of a fundamental thing of physics, you know. And so, I've got, like, this is a two and a half Newton scale. I've also got five Newton scales. I also have ten Newton scales. You always start with two and a half, and if two and a half will work, use it. If it won't work, then you move up to a five. If that won't work, you move up to a ten. So I want to determine the gravitational attraction between this block of wood and the Earth. So I'm going to take this two and a half Newton scale. Now, let me turn the lights back on. So, with these scales, because sometimes you're going to use it like this to hold things up, sometimes you're going to be pulling horizontally. However you're going to use the scale, you want to grab this tab up here and make sure that the scale is at reading zero in the position that you're going to use it. So like, I'm going to lift this block, so I'm going to take this, I'm going to hold it up. Right now, you'll notice that it isn't reading zero. So if I push that tab down, then I can re-zero that scale, that way I'm going to get an accurate reading based upon this value. So I take this, hook it up, so right now I've bottomed out this scale. So, okay, this won't work. I started with two and a half. It weighs more than two and a half newtons. I can't use this scale. Okay, so then I'm going to move up to a five newton scale and give this a read, okay? So this one I can read. So this is about 4.10 newtons. So when this block of wood is sitting here, the scale is telling me I got 4.10 newtons of force acting on the system. So, I'm going to come over here and say, all right, here's my surface, here's my block of wood. Gravity is pulling down with a value of negative 4.10 newtons. Now, I made that negative because I want to define this system mathematically. So this is just going to be a negative value pushing down. So if this is negative 4.1, what else is there? Hunter, force of the table, which we're going to call force normal. So I've got my normal force acting upward, which is going to be 4.10 newtons. So here's what's important. When I add those two forces together, what do I get? Zero. 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 And if the sum of the forces is zero, what does that mean in terms of velocity? Zero. No, no, no. It's constant. It just means that it's constant. It could be constant at zero, okay? which is what's happening here. When you add forces together, and if they add up to zero, all you know is that the velocity is constant. It might be constant at zero, it might be constant at five meters per second. It doesn't make any difference. Now, if I drop the block of wood, it begins to accelerate, because then I only have the gravitational force acting on it and not the normal force acting on it. Okay, so I'm gonna take this thing and I'm gonna give it a push. It stops. Why? Friction. 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 Does the block actually want to stop? No. no. The block actually wants to keep going because of? Inertia. Inertia. Inertia is the tendency of an object to maintain a constant velocity vector. In other words, Mother Nature is lazy. So Mother Nature doesn't want to stop this thing. Mother Nature wants to keep it going. Mother Nature goes, hey, you want to stop this thing? That's going to take a force. Friction goes, hey, I got you covered. I'll make this block stop. So. If the block is going this direction, which direction do you think friction is acting? The other way. Opposite direction. So, what we're going to do is we're going to measure that amount of force it takes to keep it moving. So now, I'm going to start with my two and a half Newton scale, but this time I'm going to be pulling it horizontally. So I'm going to take the scale, I'm going to re-zero it, and then I'm going to hook this up, and then I'm going to pull it, and listen to me, I'm going to pull it at a constant velocity. Okay? Pull it at a constant velocity. So that takes about 1.10 newtons of force to pull this thing at a constant velocity. So I've got this force going this way, which is what I'm using 
fully. Now I'm going to call this FAP, which stands for Force Applied. Your force applied can come from you, it could come from a rocket engine, it could come from the engine in your car. This is FAP, okay? And that's going to be 1.10 newtons. If I added together all the forces at this point, would it add up to equal to zero? No. No, which means the block should have been accelerated. But was the block accelerated? No. So that means there has to be a force acting in the opposite direction. What do you think the value of that force is acting in the opposite direction? Negative 1.1. Oh, that's kind of cool, right? So this is going to be my force friction, which is going to be negative 1.10 newtons. Now, oddly enough, I add all this together, I get zero. You say. So is the object moving? Yes. 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 Do all the forces add up equal to zero? Yes. So is it accelerating? No. 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 Okay? Got the idea. So forces that act in opposition to motion are in a broad category, what we call FOPs, okay? Which are opposing forces. So in terms of this, my opposing force is friction. If I go to lift the block, what do you think my opposing force is? Gravity. So opposing forces just work in opposition to what you're trying to do. So you have FAPs trying to move it forward. You have FOPs working against you. So as long as you add FAP and FOP, and they add up to equal to zero, what are you gonna, what, what's going to happen? What's the situation? You're going to be at constant velocity. Now, if I add forget, which is my gravitational force, and soon, right? So if I add forget, fitin, fap, and fop, and those all add up to equal to zero, what's going to happen? Constant velocity. If I, if I add them together and I don't add up to equal to zero, what's the thing going to do? Accelerate. Sorry, those are the only two things that can happen. Hey, that's it. If they add up to equal to zero, they're a constant velocity. If they don't, you accelerate. It's a binary function. Those are the only two things you can do. Now, on your equation sheet, down, down about the sixth line down, you have this. Mu times force normal equals force friction. So this mu is what's called the coefficient of friction. Okay. So this coefficient of friction mm -hmm. is basically an indication of how much friction there is in the system. So what we're going to try and do is that we're going to try and measure the coefficient of friction between this block of wood and this surface. So to get mu by itself, what am I going to divide? Yeah, I'm going to take, so mu is going to equal divided by fun, right? So here's the problem. First off, even though it's not on your sheet, this is technically an absolute value because this is just a ratio of forces. So since this is just a ratio of forces, this is a scalar quantity. So it doesn't make any sense to make it negative. It's just, it's just a number. So here's the anomaly of force friction. We're going to spend a lot of time talking about force friction. But we never directly measure force friction. Okay? We never directly measure it. What we do is we figure out how much force it takes to keep it moving. And then that's a reflection <coughs> of the frictional force. So if you go back to what we just did, I didn't measure my force friction. What I did is I measured how much force it took to keep it moving. By knowing how much force it takes to keep it moving, guess what? By default, I know what the frictional force is. Okay? Now, it'd be like you go to mom and dad, mom and dad say, hey, you and mom and dad say, hey, I need five bucks. Why? Well, I'm going to the movie. Okay, so mom and dad don't know what the cost of the movie is, but they, they're going to figure out that it's probably five bucks, because that's why you've asked for five bucks. So, I don't know what the frictional force is, but I know it takes 1.10 newtons of force to pull it. So, therefore, I know my frictional force has to be 1.1 in the opposite direction. Okay? Makes sense. Great. Is friction dependent on weight? Yes. More a function of the, of the material itself, but we'll get into that later. Now, so I want to calculate mu. 
So in this situation, I'm going to take my frictional force. Now, I'm just going to write this as 1.10 newton. I'm not going to make it negative because it's a scalar quantity. Okay? When I get to mu, it's just a number. So there's no need in me making this negative. It doesn't matter. So I'm going to take 1.1 divided by 4.4. So when I take 1.1 and divide it by 4, what units am I going to get for mu? It's a trick question. Nothing. Not Nothing. 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 Because I'm dividing the newtons by newtons. Mu has no units. Okay? It's one of the very few times in physics where you're going to have a number and it has no units. Hunter. So what does it mean? We'll get, I'll tell you in just a second. We're, we're going to do a little comparison. Okay? So somebody take 1.1 divided by 4.4. You should get 0.25. Okay. You point two five. Now, so Hunter had a legitimate question. He goes, "Okay, it's a number. What does it mean?" Well, basically, what this is going to tell me is how much frictional force there is in the system. Because imagine this: What if I took my surface and I put down a thin coat of oil on this table before I did this lap? What do you think is going to happen to? the amount of force it takes to pull that block if it's on a thin coat of oil. It's going, to be, it's going to be a lot less. So if this drops, then if I go over to this calculation, I'm not going to change the weight of the block by putting oil down. But this is going to become a smaller number. So if I divide a smaller number by the same weight, what's going to happen to my coefficient of friction? It's going to get bigger. So Here's the deal. So when you look at your coefficient of friction, it's just a reflection of how much friction there is in the system. As this gets bigger and bigger and bigger, that just means there's more and more friction. Okay? Is that, is that 4.4 or is that, are we still talking about the block? Yeah, Where is the that, block. What was that 4.4 from? The 4.4 was, oh, it was 4.1, uh, my bad. My bad, it's 4.1. I couldn't read my own handwriting. And wouldn't the top number have to be negative? No, 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 because it's an absolute value. Oh, okay. I didn't know. Yeah, this is actually 4.1. Redo this. Take 1.1 and divide it by 4.1. It, it's going to change it a little bit. Take 1.1 and divide it by 4.1. Anyone have a question? <laughs> <laughs> love of God. <laughs> Great, I thought you were on it. I, I, you know, I was. Man, he's got, he's got the cast on the finger, man. Yeah. You can't, you're yeah. counting on that kid. Come on. I was looking at you. Come on, man. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. 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 Oh my God, do we have the calculator? Anybody? Yeah, I got it. Seven. I got it. Don't Eight throw it. Mom, I got it. What'd you get? 0 0.27. 0 0.27. There we go. 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 There we what we just found is what's known as the coefficient of kinetic friction. Kinetic friction comes from the Greek word kinesis, which means the energy, which was the study of motion. So there's two types of friction that we're going to look at. You can have what we just did, which is kinetic friction, which is the which is associated with motion. So in that situation, I pulled it along at a constant velocity, and we measured the force applied. That was the same as my force friction. The other type of friction that you're going to have is static friction. And static friction is from rest. So here, now, measuring your static friction is more difficult because there's a little bit more of a technique involved. So to get your coefficient of static friction, what you're going to do is you're taking the block, it's going to be at rest, hence the term static friction. Re-zero your scale, and you're going to hook it up 
and you're going to slowly increase the amount of force until it just begins to slide. Okay, hence the term front rest. So I've got my block, I'm going to pull until it just begins to move. So that busted loose at about 1.80 newtons. So here's what I want you to look at. With the kinetic friction, there's 1.10 newtons divided by 4.10 newtons, and that was what, 0.27? Mm -hmm. with, the, with the static friction, that was like 1.80 newtons divided by 4.10. So somebody Mary, someone, take 1.8 divided by 4.1. 0.44. Point 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 four four. Four. Oh, four four. Four. <laughs> so here's what you will generally see. Not always. What, what you will see generally is that the coefficient of static friction is bigger than the coefficient of kinetic friction, okay, as a general rule. Because it's at rest, it wants to remain at rest. That's why that happened. So there's a couple of things about mu that I want you to understand. First off, mu is almost always going to be less than 1. If you ever get a mu bigger than 1, especially if you get like 4, 5, 10, something like that, you have done something horribly wrong. Most of the time in this class, and unless it's something weird, your coefficient of friction is going to be less than 1. Usually around, a high end might be like 0.8. Typically it's around 0 0.5, 0 0.4, 0 0.3 sometimes. So if you ever, ever, ever calculate a coefficient of friction that's either negative or a really big number, you have done something wrong. Yes, ma'am. Here, let me keep it here. Take, take this lab. We'll, just, we'll finish it on Monday. There's no way we can do that. Okay. Got that idea. So Sam, for Max, stop that. Uh, huh? He didn't have his lab. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it comes down here. Now we do a cool meeting. Look, just turn that into a block. Ooh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So, here's what you're going to do. And no, we're not going to get done with this today. We're just going to get a good start. So, you got wood on wood. So you got, oddly enough, you're going to have a block of wood. Oddly enough, the tables are made out of wood. So, yes, yeah, I know. So then, you're going to take like a two and a half Newton scale, start with that, take the scale, hold it up, whatever it reads, boom, there's your force gravity, which is the same as the force normal. Okay, that's it. Don't have to worry about that. Then you're going to do static. So you're going to take your scale, re-zero it so that and however you're going to use it, it's reading zero. You're going to take it up, hook it up, and then you're going to increase that force until it just begins to move, and then you're going to record that number. You then, to get the coefficient of static friction, you're going to take the force that you just measured, divide that by your normal force, and that's going to be a number. Not a big deal. Then, you're going to do the kinetic one. So you're going to take this, hold it at a constant velocity, whatever that reading is, there's that number, divide that by your force normal, that's the second column. I, I at least want to see all the calculations on the first row going across. I don't necessarily have to see all of them, but I at least want to see those first set of calculations so that I know what you're doing. So, the next thing you want to do is aluminum on wood. Oddly enough, we have a piece of aluminum. And you're going to do the same thing. You're going to put it on here, hold down the aluminum. Pull it at a constant velocity, pull it from rest, get the number. You got sandpaper, put the sandpaper down, pull it, and cloth is going to be this. Okay? Get all the data. Now, why? <laughs> what do you mean why? It's cold back here. My hands look a little dry. I appreciate it. Okay. So here's the next part that you're gonna do. Then what we're going to start to do is we're going to see, by, we're going to see the effects of adding weight onto the block and what's that, what that does to friction. So here's what you're going to do. you got the block. Let's say this weighed 2 newtons, just to make the math easy. Then you're going to take 200 gram mass like this. So 200 gram mass is how many kilograms? 
Point two. Point two. Point two times 9.8 gets you 1.96. Thanks for playing. So this weighs 1.96 newtons. It's a 200 gram mass, but it weighs 1.96 newtons. So what you're going to do is you're going to take this 1.96 newton, you're going to put that on top of the 2 newton block for a grand total of about 4 newtons. Then you're going to take your scale and you're going to pull this and you're going to see how much force it takes to pull that from rest, which was about 2 and a half. So you're going to do that. So to get this force normal column, take the 200, the 500, the 700, the 1000. You're going to add those to it and then you're going to add that to the weight of the block itself. Then you're going to measure the force applied. Now pay attention. Yes, I'm going to add, say, the R word. And I'm going to tell you that you're going to keep track. Oh, no. Anyway, start lab. I knew Anson fun. Because he has. Can we take this block? No, I'm not. 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 I